All right, guys, welcome to your Monday Night Raw review here on the WWE Podcast. We've got quite the review tonight, and I have to, to give you just a warning up front. This may not be a very positive review with so many head-scratching moments on Monday Night Raw, certainly not without its bright spots, but uh, fair warning, disclaimer up front, this may not be the most positive Monday Night Raw review, so if you like a little bit of ranting, this one may be for you. So we're going to get going right after this. Hey, so if you guys haven't listened to the podcast Long Shot Leaders yet, you're missing out. And you may ask, what's so special about this podcast? Well, number one, it is hosted by Michael Stein. He's an entrepreneur, actor, filmmaker, comedian, and self-help expert. And he's come up with a really great idea for his show. What he does is tell stories of underdogs who found success. For example, some of his guests that he's had on, Sean Spector, he's the co-founder of Gamefly and Dropoff. Bruce Valanche, he's a six-time Emmy Award winner, writer, and actor. And most recently, he interviewed former WWE writer, Vince Russo. And the conversation was awesome. I mean, we got insight from Vince that I have not heard from any other podcast, including what he believes makes a, a great wrestler, why some people can't stand Vince Russo today because of the on-screen heel character that he played. And he talked about something that means even more to him than the massive ratings that occurred during the Attitude Era. So guys, go check out Long Shot Leaders with Michael Stein. It's available on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. It's already got a perfect five-star rating. I mean, that's unheard of with podcasts. So go check out Long Shot Leaders with Michael Stein. There is such a great diversity of hosts and topics that it will definitely inspire you, and you'll be able to find something that you can relate to. So go check out Long Shot Leaders today. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. Your number one source for the latest in WWE news and straightforward analysis. Are you ready to get this thing going? Give me a hell yeah! I said give me a hell yeah! Then let's get this show started right now. And welcome to your Monday Night Raw review here on the WWE Podcast. And I warned you guys up front... Air warning, disclaimers all over this show about uh, about the, the feeling I had about Monday Night Raw. And maybe you guys felt differently about the show. Maybe you felt that it was, or I'm being a little bit unfair to WWE for what they produced to uh, for us last night. Um, it just did not sit well with me on many, many levels. But, but I don't want those who are tuning in for the first time to think that we sit here and we just complain about the product. That's not what we do. I mean, that's not what we do. That's not what our team does here. We do make sure that we are honest, right? Like that is the first and foremost thing. We're not about clickbait. We're not about cussing and all that kind of stuff. You can find that anywhere else really on, on the, uh, on the podcast platform that you're listening to this, to this on. We just want to be f- straightforward, honest, and give you a very easy to listen to show. And hopefully that's what this is. But uh, boy, oh boy, was Raw rough last night for me. Um, Again, there were some bright spots. Sheamus and Ricochet, I think, were excellent. Uh, Asuka and Charlotte uh, is another. But, um, you know, beyond the the bright spots, darkness overshadowed this this show for sure for me. And those that think and hope Kofi Mania 2 is on its way, um, I don't. (laughs) I just have zero interest in Kofi Kingston being WWE champion ever again and the victory he got last night if that's any indication of how you earn an opportunity well then sign me up because I could do the same thing right uh that was essentially a heel victory for a babyface character um and yet the heel was the one playing the babyface when you look at how that match went down it was um well, I'll dive into that a little bit more later on. But first, I would like to welcome those to the show that are new, and we do have several of them. Uh, thank you so much for choosing us over, well, in conjunction probably with other wrestling podcasts. Hell, I listen to other wrestling podcasts, but thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen uh, to us here. And I promise we're not always this negative. Really, we're not. Um, I just, everything about Raw, nearly everything, uh, just 
hit all of my buttons and maybe those aren't yours, but, uh, Hey, this is my show. So, okay. Uh, all right. Well, um, first of all, if you want to join us on Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash WWE podcast. And for a dollar, you get all the, our shows ad free and you get the shout outs and everything else like that. Merchandise. Uh, you can also come on the show. There are two extra shows that are available on Patreon that are not available here, which is the what if segment with Anthony DeMarco and myself every week. We sit down and talk about what if scenarios this past week. We did what if Stone Cold never got injured in 1997. So that is uh, and was a great conversation that we had about uh, Austin's career and what it would have looked like had he not gotten injured. That was this past week and available to patrons who are on the raw tier and higher. Um, We also do a wrestling nostalgia show that is available to all patrons for all tiers. uh, And that is actually debuting on uh, re-debuting on uh, Wednesdays or premieres on Wednesdays. I don't know. Whatever terminology you want to use, it drops on Wednesdays. So that'll be tomorrow for uh, those who are on Patreon. Um, Okay. So Monday Night Raw. Coming off of WrestleMania Backlash, you know, you're hoping for a refresh. You're hoping for new new programs. You're hoping for fresh faces, new feuds, as we finally, finally, we are out of the WrestleMania uh, branding, hopefully, of pay-per-views for the foreseeable future. The next pay-per-view is... Hell in a Cell. And somebody actually sent me on Twitter, I don't know who it was, <laughs> that the next match or the next pay-per-view is going to be WrestleMania Hell in a Cell. And there was a logo created for it. Uh, so whoever you are, uh, you angered me and made me laugh at the same time. So I'm, I really don't know who that was. But the reasoning, as I as I look into this, and I was talking with one of my co-hosts, Mimi, uh, about why they switched Hell in a Cell this year from October to uh, May. Because typically this is money in the bank, right? This is the money in the bank time. And they now switched it to Hell in a Cell. And uh, the rumor, well, not rumor, the, the confirmation is that WWE is looking to go back on the road full time starting in mid-July. July 15th, 16th, 17th. So the Thunderdome era looks like it's coming to an end. It finally looks like the Thunderdome Thunderdome era is on its way out the door. And uh, I appreciate the Thunderdome era. It's better than the Performance Center era with no fans and then fake NXT fans uh, that are trying to pose as real fans that just were not. I mean, obviously they weren't, but it's fine. You know, they did the best they could with what they had. I'm not faulting WWE for anything that they did. I, I really do truly appreciate them sticking through the pandemic and giving us something to look forward to during those dark, dark days last year when we didn't know what to do, where to go. We, you know, we were home locked in our homes, essentially, uh, you know, we didn't know how bad the virus is going to get. And, you know, there were no sports. Every sport went down one by one. All of them fell except WWE that continued to pump out content, continued to keep us distracted, albeit in a very strange environment of no fans and deadly silent, in a de- deadly silent uh, environment. And again, I, I do truly appreciate what they provided to us. And they then evolved into the Thunderdome. And I know that they will forever look at this as the Thunderdome era. I think fans may... Uh, fans may look at this as a, as the pandemic era, and I know that they probably don't want it to be branded as that, but it will be, I think. Uh, but I, whatever the terminology is, it did evolve into the, the video boards, and having fans there virtually was fun, uh, because especially going from the Performance Center for so many months and the WrestleMania 36 that we will never forget of how quiet and weird and eerie it was. Austin came back on 316 day with no fan reaction. It, it was just, it, it's almost like a nightmare. <laughs> it was just a nightmare to watch. Um, and to go from that to the Thunderdome, though, was a massive step up. Because they went not only uh, and brought fans back virtually, but they also changed location to a normal arena that they would perform at. Um, and obviously they took Tropicana Field and uh, 
the Amway Center and, you know, I, I'm not the Amway. Was it the Amway Center? I, I may be off on that. But they brought it back to a place that was familiar to us. They brought the pyro back. They pumped in crowd noise. And it, they did the best they could to make it feel as normal as possible. There really isn't anything else they could have done to make it feel more normal. And yes, we got the one-off of fans back at WrestleMania. That was a one-off. We know that. Um, but now that we are staring summertime in the face, it looks like we are going to be back. WWE looks to be back full-time on the road starting in mid-July. So... That is probably the best news that I can deliver today, that we will have the lifeblood, the soul of wrestling back. And that's you, you guys and me and everyone listening and everyone maybe watching, right? We actually have YouTube. So watching is kind of a thing. That is the soul of wrestling and it it will be returning in mid-July. Of course, things could change. I hope not. Uh, A lot of mask restrictions are being lifted. I know here in New York, as of tomorrow, the 19th, the uh, mask mandate will be lifted. Social distancing will be lifted for fully vaccinated people. Now, you know, and I know that there are going to be people that are not fully vaccinated that just go, yeah, I'm fully vaccinated. No problem. Right. And they're not fully vaccinated. But... There's nothing you can do about that. Nothing. You can't ask to see their health card, right? It's HIPAA. You can't violate their health laws and privacy. So good luck figuring out who's vaccinated and who's not. Uh, You know, so anyway. But my point is, I don't want to get into a political discussion or or COVID discussion. That, That certainly fills all of our news feeds. The point is, wrestling seems to be coming back to its normal state, to what we knew Prior to this whole just life halting event that st- that that uh, slammed us all in March of 2020, and it looks like what some 14 months later, it is finally going to be coming to an end. And maybe it already feels like it is where you are. I know if you're in Florida, Texas, a lot of the southern states are like, "What are you, a pandemic? What's what's COVID?" Right? COVID? How do you say it? Right? (laughs) So some of them probably, you know, it seems like as if they are just, they've moved on completely. So it it all depends and it's relative to where you live. So, okay. Uh, But I wanted to deliver that positive news before I get into this Monday Night Raw review because, um, my goodness, uh, you know what? I'm going to continue to continue the positivity wave because I want to, I want to make you feel good before I bring you way, way down. That's kind of the guy I am. I like to bring out a, as Vince McMahon would say, I like to take you on a ride, right? That's, um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, he's said that many times uh, through many documentaries and, and things. Okay. So what else did I like? Seamus and Ricochet, right? Seamus and Ricochet was very good. Uh, I did not like the story going into it. So I will say that the story of Ricochet being a you know 15 year old high school bully of just taking people's clothes as as if it's some kind of joke or funny, I don't get that. Um, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to relate to that or feel sympathetic towards him or root for a guy that's just being obnoxious and taking other people's clothes. Um, it, it's not funny. It's not entertaining. Whatever. So the story was just bad uh, going into why they're fighting. Uh, Seamus is pissed off and, uh, he ends up obviously having a match with Ricochet, who's just being obnoxious about taking his, his hat and his coat. And the match was really good. I, I, again, it was physical. Ricochet reminds you just how good he is in the ring. It was awesome. Yes, we did get another kick out of a finisher, which, uh, Seamus kicked out of the 450 splash from Ricochet. Uh, I, again, I, that was... <laughs> Another one of those things that I mentioned during the pay-per-view um, two nights ago is that uh, more often than not, every single match has to include a kick out of a finish. That needs to be rectified sooner than later because pretty soon finishers are going to be looked at as transitional moves. And it's, the fans are now starting to believe, and probably already do, we probably are already there, that it's going to take two to three finishers to end a match. And doesn't that kind of go in the face of what a finisher is, right? It's kind of an oxymoron to say that because how can you finish 
a match with a move that's not actually finishing the match. You can't call it a finisher then. You can call it a signature move if we're going to be video game, uh, using video game lingo here. But I just, I don't know. Uh, the, I, I could do without the constant kickouts of finishes, not just on pay-per-views now, but they're leaking everywhere. Just, they're, they're just hemorrhaging. WWE is hemorrhaging the kickouts of finishes. For whatever reason, they think it adds drama. It doesn't because we've seen it way too many times. So now we just expect it. If someone hits a finish and gets a three count on the first finish, you're like, what? Whoa, okay. And it should be the very opposite. And and that should tell you where we stand with what finishers mean today. But my point is, this match was good. And the Spanish fly from Sheamus was, was crazy. Of course, the 450 splash is always fun to watch. And the bro kick. That bro kick that Ricochet took at the end. The, the guy's got to have a concussion. It, it, or, or very close to... The, the the kick he took, he didn't even put his hands up. It was a straight, you know, uh, sole of the foot to Ricochet's head, and it, it was brutal. So, wow, uh, I guess props to Ricochet, props to Sheamus, who's always just so good in his matches, uh, and, and I believe is an unsung hero of Monday Night Raw in, in a few, you know, many ways, really. And, uh, you know, I still believe him to be never really a top, top, top tier guy, but certainly can easily main event, uh, can be a champion for short durations. The the guy, and I'm talking WWE or Universal Champion, the guy can carry that and is more than seasoned enough, certainly, to uh, handle the pressure and everything like that comes with that belt. But he has the United States Championship, and it looks like Ricochet is going to continue to fight Sheamus. And, I don't know, maybe next week he'll steal his boots or... Uh, his uh, his travel bag. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's just it's a little bit sophomoric for for Ricochet the babyface to be pulling high school, middle school pranks on Sheamus. But uh, credit to both men. It probably was the match of the night. I, I have to say that it was it was that good. And I would not mind seeing these two wrap it up again uh, or lock things up again in uh, you know maybe at Hell in a Cell or some kind of multi person match with Sheamus. I, I will say, too, that the United States Championship and Sheamus have not gotten a whole lot of Hulu time, meaning WWE doesn't deem him and his program uh, important enough to put on the on, on Hulu. That's how you know kind of where things are prioritized in WWE's mind. Furthermore, as we move on to a, a different match that was not on Monday Night Raw, and uh, that match was AJ Styles and Elias. So that match did not happen on Monday night raw, at least on the Hulu version of, uh, of the show. And uh, so I'm reading the results here of that match. The, the, the final segment Riker yanked styles off the apron to cause a DQ almost tried to go after Omas tried to go after Riker while Elias threw steel uh, styles into the steel steps. Um, yeah, I mean, on, on both of these guys' heels. So, the, 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 I feel like WWE is way too heavy on the New Day, relying on them to always come to the babyface need in the tag team division. The, you know, their inability to create babyface teams, and hell, AJ and Omos could easily be a babyface team. You could argue they already are. But... They don't even put them on the paper. Number one, they skipped them on the uh, WrestleMania Backlash pay-per-view. Uh, they were missing for five weeks after WrestleMania, or four weeks after WrestleMania. Uh, they weren't on the Hulu version of Raw this past week. It just goes to show you and continues to solidify my belief and many people's belief that Vince doesn't give a damn about the tag team division or the tag team championships. If he gets around to it, he gets there. But it's never going to be a priority ever. And I've seen enough wrestling, and I'm sure you have too, to know through the years that it's it's never a priority. Never. So certainly this was showing its ugly face again. This lack of uh, this lack of initiative to to help thrust the tag team division where it should be or where it could be, and not relying on the new day all the time. 
So, uh, you know, and I'm a huge fan of AJ Styles, and Omasa is a good foil for him, too. They, they work well together. They have good chemistry. Uh, Omas is okay in the ring. He's got a presence that overshadows anything he may lack in the ring. So there's that. So, okay. Um, but moving on here, MVP at the beginning of the show comes out and allows an open challenge to be made known that Bobby Lashley is going to offer an open challenge. He never said it was for the WWE championship. And that of course comes to rear its ugly head at the end of the show. And with some absolute illogical booking on like four levels that we're going to dive into, but uh, he allows an open challenge to be issued. And throughout the show, I have to say, Throughout the show, we did get a couple, at least off the top of my head, guys who were going to take up Lashley on that offer and say that they were going to be accepting the open challenge. And one, two of them were Sheamus and Ricochet. I believe those those were two. I, I know there was more. but and, and I like how that actually was you know woven through the show. But um, if it's an open challenge... Right, and and I don't care if it's for the, for the WWE Championship or not. Uh, how does that work? Because is it like first guy to gorilla position wins? Is it you know draw the draw the the short straw and you're it? Is it duck duck goose? I mean, I mean, I'm being real. Like, how does WWE deal with a situation like that? Or how would you if you were a professional organization? And this was a shoot, not a work. How would you deal with guys who are like, okay, I'm accepting the open challenge. I'm accepting the open challenge. I'm accepting the open challenge. And it's like, okay, guys, first one here wins. Is it first come first serve? That of course that was never even thought of or even asked because that's just too much detail. You know, it, it doesn't make sense, but what made it even worse? I'll just get to it. What made it worse First of all, Kofi Kingston. That's number one. Now, I know that I have a lot of Kofi fans that li- listen here. And I'm a, I'm a Kofi respecter. Okay? I respect the man. He's a good dude. He's a great family man from everything I see. Of course, I don't know him personally. But from what he allows us to see, uh, he has had a very long career in WWE. He's good in the ring. To occasionally very good in the ring. Um, he's not bad on the mic. And he has had, arguably, a, a Hall of Fame career. Hey, so if you guys haven't listened to the podcast Long Shot Leaders yet, you're missing out. And you may ask, what's so special about this podcast? Well, number one, it is hosted by Michael Stein. He's an entrepreneur, actor, filmmaker, comedian, and self-help expert. And he's come up with a really great idea for his show. What he does is tell stories of underdogs who found success. For example, some of his guests that he's had on, Sean Spector, he's the co-founder of Gamefly and Drop-Off, Bruce Valanche, he's a six-time Emmy Award winner, writer, and actor, and most recently, he interviewed former WWE writer, Vince Russo. And the conversation was awesome. I mean, we got insight from Vince that I have not heard from any other podcast, including what he believes makes a a great wrestler, why some people can't stand Vince Russo today because of the on-screen heel character that he played. And he talked about something that means even more to him than the massive ratings that occurred during the Attitude Era. So guys, go check out Long Shot Leaders with Michael Stein. It's available on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. It's already got a perfect five-star rating. I mean, that that's unheard of with podcasts. So go check out Long Shot Leaders with Michael Stein. There is such a great diversity of hosts and topics that it will definitely inspire you, and you'll be able to find something that you can relate to. So go check out Long Shot Leaders today. Welcome back to the WWE Podcast. Let's get back to more great wrestling audio. And he had Kofi Mania. 
But to me, that's where it stops. And you would think, that's enough. Why Why shouldn't you support him? You just listed everything that you would like about the guy. Okay. I, as again, this is nothing personal. It has nothing to do with his character as an actual human being. This is just Kofi Kingston as part of the New Day. I think Kofi Kingston is the worst part of the New Day. He is why, a big reason why, the New Day to me were unstomachable for quite a while. Not just because they had been around for so long, but because of Kofi Kingston's can't take anything serious attitude that, yes, was woven through the entire New Day character, but Kofi was the pinnacle of that. Don't believe me? How about you lose the WWE Championship after holding it for six months, going through Kofi Mania, celebrating it with your family in the ring, to have Brock Lesnar come in, beat you in, I don't know, 10 seconds, whatever it was, and then the next week you're coming out and you're, you're throwing pancakes like nothing happened. Uh, how am I supposed to possibly ever get behind you again. Now, I wasn't a big supporter of him anyway, winning the WWE Championship. I'm just not a Kofi fan. I find him obnoxious. He, The way that he, his humor is, I don't know. I'm not a fan of his humor, style of humor. Um, it's just something about him at, in that character. It, it It's just uh, unwatchable most of the time for me. Xavier Woods fits that role. Big E at when he did uh when he was, when he was actually part of the new day fit the role as just this gyrating you know uh, kind of loud guy that uh was the muscle of the new day but it was kind of fun to watch him as such a big dude do all these wacky things Kofi Kingston is kind of caught in the middle where the new day would survive just fine without him if you're asking me which part of the new day what would be the most important and the soul of it? It'd be Xavier Woods. He is, if you're going to take one guy, the new day, Xavier Woods is the soul of that group. Kofi Kingston to me is an extra. He's always felt like an extra. He just has in part of that group. Again, I know I'm going to get some backlash for this. That's fine. Everybody's got their own opinions on, on, on everything with wrestling and everything in general, but Kofi is not my favorite. Now that said, What happened this past week on Raw? Kofi Kingston comes out and uh, accepts the open challenge. First question I have, uh, where the hell were all the other guys that were saying they accept the open challenge to come out and say, whoa, 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 wait, wait, Um, it's me, 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 me. Or if you are uh, a Finding Nemo fan, uh, mine, 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 mine. I mean, really. For, I'm dating myself now. That movie's like how like 18 years old. I don't understand if you're going to accept the open challenge, why you wouldn't come out when the match is starting for the for the challenge you accepted. Where, where is everybody? And Kofi comes out and he's just like, yeah, oh, hey, hey guys, yeah, I accept too. And he did earlier in the night. But I don't understand this. This made no sense. You know, it's the WWE Championship, or at least the perceived match for the WWE Championship, and yet no one is taking the call. Now, you could say, well, the other guys got privy to the fact that it's not for the championship. I'm not going to face Bobby if the belt's not on the line. We're not going to get that level of detail. No one's going to care. Are we just supposed to fill in the blanks that they got a heads up that it's not for the belt somehow and Kofi was blind to it? No. I mean, that's preposterous. But it made no sense that after Kofi comes out, no one contested it. No one came out and, you know, there was no brawl or argument over, wait a minute, I accept it, I accept it. None of that. It it was just, it was ridiculous. So Kofi Kingston comes out and, of course, MVP drops the news that this is not for the WWE Championship, which I kind of, you know, I I had a sneaking suspicion. And what happens? Oh, well, they had a good match, as expected. But we got a Drew McIntyre interference taking the cane of of uh, of MVP and striking Lashley in the torso with it, causing Kofi Kingston to get a roll-up victory. Oh, yeah. Roll-ups were the finish of the night. And typically, there are at least one per show. There was like four of them 
on Monday Night Raw. You talk about lazy booking. Lazy. So they, they, they you know, Kofi got a win. They're celebrating like it's an, a, a uh, an earned victory over Bobby Lashley. McIntyre's smiling with the New Day, which I'm starting to sour on McIntyre now. Like, I'm really starting to turn on Drew McIntyre as a character. Respect through the roof. As a character, he's starting to turn for me. Does anyone else feel this way? I was hoping once my, uh, Backlash went away, so would Drew from the WWE title picture. And yet, here he is. Here he is still. He accepted the open challenge at the beginning of the show. Of course, MVP said there's stipulations that Braun and himself could not uh, accept. But lo and behold, we have McIntyre just who will not leave the WWE title picture. And now he's you know, smiling with the New Day. I mean, if he starts doing hip gyrations next week, uh, I will, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll I'm not going to threaten to stop watching wrestling because that no one cares about that, right? When people say, "Oh, if, if you do this, I'm going to stop watching," right? As if that's some kind of threat to yourself. But uh, I, I will. Uh, I promise you, I'll make an explicit content uh, podcast, right? So it, it'll be really bad, really, really, really bad if that happens. If he joins the New Day and he's like an honorary member or something like that, which I could see WWE doing because he think they think that'd be funny. Uh, I will go through the roof. But for the night anyway, he just is arm in arm with Kofi and Xavier and thinks it's funny that he cost Bobby the match. Yet Kofi was the baby face here and should have uh, at least had some credibility in this matchup. And yeah, he held his own. But at the same time, he got a very flawed victory on top of a roll up. I mean, does it get any more flawed than that? And yet people are crying and calling for Kofi Mania too. Uh, who's calling for that? Please. I want to talk to you people. Why? Why, why are we calling for Kofi Mania too? Because Vince doesn't know where else to go. He can't go back to Drew or perceivably not. Um, he has no other baby faces on the roster that can face Bobby Lashley. Is that the problem? The lack of stars? I'd agree with that. But uh, Kofi Mania, Kofi is come and gone, my friend. Kofi Mania is, thank goodness, dead and buried. And I just, I don't need to see Kofi Mania 2. Please, guys, stop trending it. Because WWE actually does care about that kind of stuff. So, uh, please, I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Uh, but uh, now some people are just going to do it out of spite. Uh, I would. So, the other thing I'd like to mention that wasn't ever really talked about, and I've watched and or, uh, read other people's reviews, including Bleacher Report. Uh, I actually do, I read the reviews. I've got some good stuff. But... At the beginning of the show, we had a bunch of women with Drew McIntyre, presumably bought and paid for by MVP. As he said, I had a surprise for you. I told you I'd come through. Uh, Now, is it and are they supposed to be women of the night? I, 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 I don't think so. But they're like a PG... Godfather, uh, Ho Train, twenty twenty one version. It it felt a little like they regressed twenty years last night. With that, I, I don't, I don't understand the need for it. That he's this this champion that just is enamored with himself and the women and the fame and the money. Is that the perception? Uh, I, that didn't do anything for me. All it did was just kind of make me go, wow. You know, all this talk for women's evolution and uh, equality and more airtime, and yet they take eight women. Again, none of them were active WWE Raw performers, of course. But the perception of it still is they just took this, these women and put them in scantily clad clothing, at least for 2021 WWE standards, and all they did was just they were kind of all over him clapping and just – doe-eyed for Bobby uh, Bobby Lashley. So it it, it just, it, it felt very 1999-ish, didn't it? With all those women with their, you know, their boobs popping out and their short skirts. all It's just like, eh, come on. I mean, that's the exact opposite image that you want for the women in WWE. And I understand that they aren't the wrestlers themselves. 
that they're not going out and having Playboy pillow fights and, uh, the, you know, tearing each other's clothes off or throwing each other into gravy bowls and wrestling. I, I, I get that. But it still presents women as sex objects. There's no other way to look at how MVP and Bobby and those those five, six women, however many there were, uh, were presenting them selves as and and I, I don't know no no one's really talking about it and then by the way they screamed bloody murder when McIntyre came out and punched Lashley in the face I'm like you know where you are right you're on Monday Night Raw have you ever seen wrestling do you know what wrestling is and they screamed like there was a couple of them that couldn't stop screaming it and it's like where do you think we are? It, they acted like somebody just got shot right in front of them. I mean, talk about overacting, but I don't Did anyone else feel this way about the women that were surrounding Lashley? It felt very much uh, like 1999. Okay, we're going to take a quick break for the sponsor of the show. But on the other side, we are going to get to Charlotte and Asuka. Uh, it doesn't get any better from here. And Rhea Ripley does not help. Um, okay, guys, <laughs> buckle up. We'll be right back. So have you heard of Paper Posh before? Paper Posh is an entrepreneur who has her own clothing collection. It's called the Fatima Razor Clothing Collection. She also has her own music. She's an aspiring artist. And right now you can check out her album. It's called Illegal Eviction. It's on sale now. But right now, what I want to do is give you a little bit of a sample of her latest song, Fight, which you can find on YouTube, by the way. Search for Fight by Paper Posh, all one word. It's available on all streaming platforms. And I'm telling you right now, this song will get stuck in your head. After I listened to it, I could not get it out of my head for the next hour. So I'm going to spread that joy to you and give you a quick sample of her music. Again, this one is called Fight, and you can find it on all streaming platforms. It's by Paper Posh. So take a listen, guys, and check out our album called Illegal Eviction. I don't like you no more. I'm going to fight you. I don't like you no more. I'm going to fight you. If I was a vampire, I would fight you. I don't like you no more. I'm going to fight you. I don't like you no more. I'm going to fight you. I don't like you no more. Welcome back to the WWE Podcast. Let's get back to more great wrestling audio. All right, let's get to the rest of Monday Night Raw here. And Charlotte, Asuka, this match was made by uh, Sonya Deville and Adam Pearce. And uh, the stipulation was that if Charlotte won, she would earn a women's championship opportunity against uh, Rhea Ripley. And it's interesting, as Charlotte came out for her entrance, that I think it might have been uh, Adin Verk who talked about how some feel that, you know, that Charlotte Flair is just given these opportunities and she's always in the title picture. And we had Corey Graves say, you sound like the internet, uh, Verk. And he went off about how the the, the name, your last name, doesn't win matches for you. You know, and and he he basically, what he did was uh, they clearly set up a segment there on purpose to rebut those on the internet who are complaining about Charlotte Flair just constantly being in the title picture. And uh, it was a it was it was a very clear shot at the fans, no question about it. But this match was good, as all Oscar Charlotte matches are. You know what kind of quality you're going to get with these two, and it's just it's so good. So uh, you know, as always, credit to both women here. And as Charlotte is getting the advantage, we have Rhea Ripley come out to watch the action. Right, I mean, we always got that innocent watching. Uh, she was seated seated next to the commentators, and uh, the Empress of Tomorrow began to fight back. I'm reading, just making sure I don't miss what happened during this match. So, yes, I'm reading part of it. I did see it. Um, <clears throat> so the Empress of Tomorrow began to fight back with some forearms and kicks. 
Ripley laughed and watched as Asuka took down Charlotte for a couple of near falls. And then they traded uh, control several times before Ripley ended up taking a big boot from Charlotte on the apron. Asuka was able to get the win with a roll-up. Now, again, here, here's what I really like. I like the chemistry with Asuka and Charlotte. So that's why at the top of the show I said this is one of the bright spots. Well, it is partially. The, the problem I have with this is how did this really cost Charlotte the match? Because she knocked Rhea off the apron. And then Asuka and her uh, squabbled back and forth, ultimately leading to a roll-up. The dreaded roll-up. I mean, how many did we get tonight? <laughs> Last night, I mean. So, yeah, we got the, the, we got the roll-up. But Charlotte kind of lost clean to Asuka, albeit a roll-up. So there was that. And I don't also know how the hell I'm supposed to feel about Rhea Ripley. I'm seeing her more and more every week and being less and less impressed of what the main roster version of her looks like. And I don't mean physically. I don't care what she does with her hair or how dark her makeup is or how unique she's trying to look and be different from the rest of the women. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about her vibe. I'm talking about the way she speaks. She is she's, I, I assume she's supposed to be a heel, right? That's my assumption. If she's supposed to be a heel... And uh, Charlotte's the one trying to challenge her. Why are we? Why are we trying to focus on Charlotte versus Rhea if they're both heels? Maybe that's why Oscar got the win this week, so that it puts her in the conversation once again for the women's championship, and Charlotte somehow sneaks her way in as well for Hell in a Cell. I don't know, but it looks like these three are nowhere near dealing with one another, and WWE is not ready to move on to another. Uh, another challenger or challengers for Rhea Ripley. Uh, but in general, I think Rhea Ripley, in terms of a report card, if I was going to score them on A to F, I'd give them a D with how they have handled Rhea Ripley. Not a total bomb, but boy, is it close. The way that they've just positioned her, uh, her promos have not been good. She's coming off obnoxious. And again, if you're a heel, I guess that's the point. Uh, but it's also against Charlotte Flair, which to me, I don't know why we're supposed to boo her. Really, I don't understand why we're supposed to boo Charlotte Flair. She is one of the best, if not the best, in the women's division, hands down. She instantly adds star power. She's exactly what she says she is. She is the opportunity. She consistently puts on good matches with anybody. She's gotten very good on the mic now. Her promo skills and promo cadence and her, the way that she delivers promos have improved. She's changed up her look. She's now Corella DeVille, apparently, uh, with her Corella. It's a, that's a tough word to say. Corella, Corella, I don't know. 101 Dalmatians villain <laughs> uh, is what she is, is, uh, is really mapping herself as or after. And she's just really refreshed herself, her character. And yet we're supposed to dislike her again. I ask why, why we're not, she's not the one screwing people out of matches and yet another distraction in another roll up. I don't understand. I'm not following this to me. Charlotte is a baby face in her heel character because fans respect her and, and, and for the other reasons I just mentioned, she's also adopted this new mean face. Anybody else notice that? She's really gone to town on this mean face. It's not a cartoonish. I'm not complaining about it. It feels like she's just kind of overusing it right now. It's like she learned it in promo class. She went to a body language expert or somebody told her in promo class, like, hey, you know, you, you should try this. And then she did it. And the, the teacher was like, oh, that's great. You know, you should try that. And then she's just continuing to use it. Uh, I don't I'm, Again, it's not a complaint or a rant, but... Uh, it feels like the mean face is like every time the camera pans to Charlotte, it's that kind of head tilted to the side and just mean look. You guys know what I'm talking about? Just this angry kind of, I don't know, infuriated look. So she's trying to emote more with her body language. Somebody, again, probably told her in promo class or she you know, said that somebody told her, look, you know, it's not all about what you say, and what you do in the ring. Don't forget about body language. And she learned this and it's fine, whatever. I'm fine with it. It's just, 
I've noticed it a lot lately. So, again, I'm finding myself supporting Charlotte in this whole thing. And WWE is kind of in a lose-lose-lose here. Because I don't think anybody really wants to see Asuka as Raw Women's Champion again. Because we just went through 10 months of basically being ignored as champion. Uh, people, I think, are a little underwhelmed with what Rhea Ripley has done thus far and the creative for her. So it's kind of a joint effort there. And Charlotte Flair, I think, for most fans, not me, but I think, because I'm, I'm better than most fans, is what I'm trying to say, uh, is that, <laughs> uh, of course I'm kidding, but I think most fans view Charlotte as always having the championship, always being in the title picture. And I think fun, some fans may resent WWE or, uh, or or the decision to put the belt on Charlotte if it happens. And I think it will sooner than later, I hope. But to me, Charlotte is the baby face here. She has spoken truth. She's reinvented herself, uh, re rejiggered herself. I'm trying to think of the right terminology. She's evolved. And speaking truth, she's never felt more authentic. I don't understand what the problem is here, but um, it... it I, don't know, I, I could rant about this for a while. Anyway, the Raw Women's Championship is kind of a mess right now. Just put it on Charlotte and be done with it. I mean, let's just stop tiptoeing around it. And uh, I think that's what we should do. Okay, Damian Priest versus John Morrison in a lumberjack match, a true lumberjack match, as the uh, the the, uh, the the zombies apparently have found elsewhere to uh, to uh, track down its prey. Um, Apparently, they are still chewing and, and uh, finishing the leftovers of Miz, who was not there. Um, it was just Morrison versus Damian Priest. Damian Priest also, following this match, by the way, declared himself as part of the uh, Bobby Lashley Open Challenge. He also was a no-show. So there's three. Sheamus and Ricochet and Damian Priest all declared that they were going to be a part of it. And Kofi Kingston, of course, was the only one that answered it. But uh, he was also a no-show. Uh, made no sense. So we got Damian Priest and Morrison. It's exactly what you'd expect for this match. Lots of pile on each other type of uh, spots where somebody from the top rope inevitably jumps on everyone below. And even people that aren't actually being directly knocked down just fall to the ground. Do you guys know what I'm saying there? Where there's like five people or maybe ten people that the person jumping off the top rope lands on, but yet the ancillary people on the sides that aren't even involved in this somehow just crash to the floor to make it look better. And furthermore, how is this even a thing anymore? Right? Like, I mean, if, if you've got, you know, five or 10 people that you are splashing onto and you're not that big of a guy, they should be able to catch you. Uh, and it shouldn't, everybody shouldn't just, you know, have their knees go weak and fall to the ground. Although that seems to be the spot that happens every single time. Uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit bitter tonight, guys, <laughs> with, this, with this whole Monday Night Raw nonsense. Nikki Cross was a part of the crowd, though. And she was there, although they didn't really do a whole lot with her. She's still kind of her wacky, zany, uh, just, uh, high energy self. And, uh, you know, I was kind of hoping more. I was hoping she would join Alexa. That was my hope. Um, I was hoping that when she, if she joined Alexa, then, you know, they would be able to go on a run together and she could be as twisted as Alexa, you know, no pun intended, but no, she's still just crack crazy, wacky, zany, high energy, weird, uh, Nikki cross. So I don't know. Anyway, uh, of course, Damian priest gets the victory and it was declared that he is moving on from Ms. And Morrison, you know, I've heard that before though. So I'll believe that when I see it. And that was it. So uh, Cedric Alexander also went after Shelton Benjamin, which, I mean, does anybody care? Nope. So I'm going to move on. Okay. Uh, I feel like there's something that I have missed. So I'm scanning through the night here. Just bear with me. Oh, Natalia and Tamina versus Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler. This match um, was... Just an addition to the problem of the night. Meaning, another distraction leads to another victory. And this time it was Alexa Bliss who appeared on stage and set off some flames. I don't know, maybe she learned this trick from Kane because, I mean, the the, the post was lit on fire and it set Reginald back. 
Reginald was blinded by the light, so to speak, and got shot back like he got shot out of a cannon and fell to the ground. And he was standing next to the ring post, of course. And uh, no one came to help him. You know, if you burned your eyes out or whatever, uh, the, the the medical staff certainly didn't give a damn. And they decided, hey, this this isn't really worth their, our time. You know, they didn't even try to fake like it was, uh, you know, a, a serious issue. It was just the referee holding his hand or, or hold, putting his arm on his shoulder, presumably saying, oh, come on, man, just, just walk it off. Just walk it off. You're good. You're good, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, if I was Reginald, I'd be very concerned about the the, the – uh, the level of service I got at a WWE event when my life was in danger, my eyes were in danger, and the medical staff just uh, were asleep at the wheel. Um, but this match was fine. Um, it was kind of what you'd expect with Nia Jax and uh, Tamina going one-on-one. We've seen it so many times now. But it was a fine match. I really didn't, you know, it, it was okay. It was okay. And Alexa Bliss teasing things again, and, and you know, she had... Tamina and Natalia on her playground, fine. Um, you know, apparently she's not targeting them. Perhaps it is indeed either Shayna Baszler or uh, Nia Jax. I, I, I don't particularly know right now. I'm glad, though, that Alexa Bliss is not starting at the top of the card and she's not going with, you know, Charlotte Flair right now or something like that. That she's doing her own thing, um, although she still has yet to pick an opponent, and we're no what now like six weeks removed from WrestleMania, and we still have no idea where she's going with you know her 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 next her her target. We don't know. It's still like, come on, let, can we get this going? Can we see Alexa Bliss in ring? You know that that is what I miss the most is Alexa Bliss in ring. I've seen her playground. We all get the creepiness and Lily and the laughing. Can we move to an actual program here? Although Alexa's is probably like, Hey, I haven't had to take a bump in like five months. This is great. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else did I miss? Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton. Get ready for this. So this ended up, let, let me read the description because it's better than me describing it. After a backstage altercation, Randy Orton and Kofi Kingston agreed to a match. Oh, right. So um, (laughs) this was bizarre, right? The New Day and Randy come face to face. And I'm thinking to myself, why aren't they attacking him or why aren't they angry with him? Instead, they're making jokes, calling him Randall and not even upset really with him, which was weird after he RKO'd them last week. But that doesn't matter. So Riddle said, as he's trying to play Peacemaker, he wanted everyone to get along, but he still accompanied the Viper to the ring. Xavier Woods was right there by uh, Kingston's side as usual, and they started with a basic lockup and head takeover. Uh, Let's see. I I won't describe the whole match here. Woods distracted Orton with his trombone. Here we go, guys. This is the night of distractions and roll-ups. So Kingston could roll him up. For the surprise win, Riddle kept Orton from attacking Kingston after the match, but he also shoved Woods before leaving. Okay, well, I do still like Riddle and Orton. We're all waiting for the inevitable RKO to drop. It probably will, I I would think, shortly. But uh, another roll-up victory. Another. So Kingston gets two roll-up victories last night. Both were very controversial wins and and really in the least credible way that you could win a match possible. The only thing missing was him also pulling the tights. So he beats Randy and he beats Lashley, but in extremely controversial and uncredible ways. Not incredible, uncredible or discredible. There's probably a better word. He's discredited. All right. So it just, I don't know. And I know that Orton and Kingston love working together. And Orton, Orton uh, said many times that Kingston is one of his favorites, along with Christian, to work with. And that's fine. Uh, you know, they, they do have a very good chemistry. We, I'm, I'm fine with that. It's very clear that they do when I watch them. Uh, but I don't understand Kofi Kingston getting the roll up victory here. I guess it was supposed to set him up for the second roll up victory he would get. Later in the night against Lashley. 
So, uh, Orton is uh, still kind of taking a breather from the whole uh, the, the the whole deal with Bray Wyatt. Uh, oh, and we also had a Angel Garza and Drew Gulak match. And of course, <laughs> yeah, there was zero chance this was on Hulu. But uh, let's see, I'm, I'm reading here. Uh, Drew Gulak took control right away, but Angel Garza quickly turned things around in his favor. Gulak tried to fight back, but a huge right hand from Garza rocked him. And the Latin Lothario hit a backbreaker and a running knee to the face before dropping Gulak with the wing clipper for the win. So I don't know what really this win does for Garza other than keep it him on people's radars. Uh, you know, it, it's such a fall from grace from where Gulak was on SmackDown with Daniel Bryan, isn't it? I mean, Gulak is such a good wrestler. He is like a wrestling purist to take something from C- Cesaro here. He's so good and can work with anyone. So maybe that's why they keep him around because he's such a good hand. And he's, you know, he's as plain as vanilla, but he can work with anyone and put anyone over. And so probably that's the appeal of him. But when he was with Daniel Bryan, I really enjoyed that uh, that team. Of course, that's long, long gone. So there is your Monday Night Raw review, everybody. Uh, yeah, I know it wasn't the most positive review. I did throw in as much good as I could. It was a tough show to watch for me with all the roll-ups, all the distractions, the massive plot holes. Nobody comes out, yet three or four people say they're going to to uh, ch- challenge Lashley. Uh, just, just just makes no sense. Babyface is acting like heels and then trying to sell it off like it is a credible victory. Just, just a mess. Raw was a mess last night. And, uh, it you know, I, the thing is, they've got... What, four more weeks? Maybe, no, five weeks until uh, until the next pay-per-view, June 20th, at Hell in a Cell. So, good thing is, guys, fans are coming back. That'll be great as we all get to finally tell WWE on a weekly basis exactly what we love and what we don't. So, thank you, everybody. Again, head on over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast if you want a uh, an ad-free experience and... I will say, uh, we just got a new patron as the show was going on, and uh, shout out to Blind Man. Blind Man, thank you so much. I would have shouted you out in the beginning of the show. Maybe I'll do that again as well, but um, thank you for your patronage. Enjoy the ad-free experience. Uh, shortly, in the, you know, in the coming week or weeks, we will also be providing an Apple podcast ad-free subscription because Apple is doing their subscription-based model now where you can pay to uh, to have extra features like ad-free. It's not going to be charging everybody if you're subscribed to my podcast on Apple, but it just gives the option if you want to shortly. It's not ready yet, but uh, something to think about. And uh, that more information will be coming on that. But uh, much appreciated to uh, Blind Man. Thank you so much. If you want to join Blind Man and get an ad-free experience, definitely do that as well. Thank you, everybody. I'll be back tomorrow night with your mailbag. And for those on Patreon, I'll be also not just giving you the mailbag, but also the Wrestling Nostalgia Show. So uh, another reason to go on Patreon. Thank you, everybody. As always, I'll talk to you next time. Hey, so if you guys haven't listened to the podcast Long Shot Leaders yet, you're missing out. And you may ask, what's so special about this podcast? Well, number one, it is hosted by Michael Stein. He's an entrepreneur, actor, filmmaker, comedian, and self-help expert. And he's come up with a really great idea for his show. What he does is tell stories of underdogs who found success. For example, some of his guests that he's had on, Sean Spector, he's the co-founder of Gamefly and Drop-Off. Bruce Valanche, he's a six-time Emmy Award winner, writer, and actor. And most recently... He interviewed former WWE writer Vince Russo, and the conversation was awesome. I mean, we got insight from Vince that I have not heard from any other podcast, including what he believes makes a a great wrestler, why some people can't stand Vince Russo today because of the on-screen heel character that he played, and he talked about something that means even more to him than the massive ratings that occurred during the Attitude Era. So, guys, go check out... Long Shot Leaders with Michael Stein. It's available on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. It's already got a perfect five-star rating. I mean, that that's unheard of with podcasts. So 
Go check out Long Shot Leaders with Michael Stein. There is such a great diversity of hosts and topics that it will definitely inspire you and you'll be able to find something that you can relate to. So go check out Long Shot Leaders today.